Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll speak in English because, uh, as far as I know, there are some guys here that don't speak Bulgarian. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. My name is Wojciechal Balev, or shortly Wojciechal. The reason for which I'm here is uh, because I want to share with you some uh, of our experiences in using uh, Apache Kafka in our projects, in our project, actually. Uh, this presentation, we have shown it uh, on Java 2 days, but what is different today is uh, that it is cut in half. Uh, the, missing, uh, the missing part is with uh, Kafka basics. So I won't talk about what is topic, what is partition, what is consumer group, and so on, because I suppose that you know all of this. Instead, I will tell you what kind of software we are trying to build and how exactly we use Kafka. Um, okay, this is some marketing slide that I took from my colleague. I work in Revit, in Revit Group and the main business of Revit Group is uh, that they have shops, quite a lot of shops. In these shops we are selling food, actually, tomatoes, juice and so on. Uh, Revit is quite famous, uh, well known in Germany, in Bulgaria, maybe you know their brand Billa. Okay, uh, what we do here in our uh, in Bulgaria, together with some colleagues uh, in in Cologne, we are trying to build the so-called FFP, which stands for Food Fulfillment Platform. Food Fulfillment Platform is a common name for all the software which accompanies a given product from the end supplier to the warehouse, through warehouse, the life cycle of the warehouse of the product in the warehouse, where it is located, when it ex expires, and so on. On its way to the end uh, customer, in Germany, online deliveries are getting more and more popular. On its way to another warehouse, because warehouses supply each other. And uh, on the return deliveries, when some products are broken, expired, uh, dangerous, even recalled, and so on. So this is what we are trying to do. Uh, we are building a system which is uh, based on microservices. Currently, we have uh, 100, uh, more than 140 microservices in the FFP. Uh, most of them are written in uh, Spring Boot. We use uh, Spring Kafka wrapper. We deploy all of them in gcloud, nothing special. Everything is just standard. But uh, just to get a, an idea of the scale, how, how one warehouse may look, I have uh, selected some photos for you. This is one uh, automated warehouse, which is located next to Cologne. This is one truck here. So it's quite big and really very automated. Lots of robots inside. It's very fancy. I have been there. And next, uh, this is one, another warehouse. It looks a little bit scary. Uh, in this warehouse, uh, most of the work is done manually by folks which are moving up and down, but all of them are loaded with different devices, uh, scanners, uh, mainly Android, uh, powered by Android. So they go here, you can see lots of barcodes are hanging from the, from the wall, so they move something here and there, and they scan it and so on. Several years ago, we uh, started with this platform, and we know that we are going to have lots of microservices. And that's why we had to choose a way in which our microservices will communicate. We chose Kafka. Why do we choose Kafka? Uh, why did we cho choose Kafka? Why did, didn't we choose just REST? Here is one uh, sample diagram. By the way, it looks a little bit strange. It doesn't look like on my monitor, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I have drawn here several microservices, one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's imagine that uh, microservice number one wants to call microservice number two via REST. In order for microservice two to um, compile a response, it may need to call service three. Service three may need to call service four, service four, service five, which is currently down here. Uh, and when it is down, we have to find out a way how to handle this uh, situation. And we stick to some approaches like circuit breaker. We may use Hystrix. By the way, Hystrix is no longer supported by Netflix. There is a new star in the sky. I think it's called Resilience 4J. 
Uh, and we have to handle timeouts and so on and so, so forth. So this is bringing some complications. Further on, we have performance issues. When these services call each other, we have latencies. And the, uh, these latencies sum up when we have a long uh, call chain. So we have kind of performance problems, anticipated some performance problems. Then we are running into dependencies. So the, the team that uh, implements service one wants, uh, for example, to make a call to service two. So we have to go to the team with service. They have to go to the team which is implementing service two. They have to agree on the API and so on. They have to put some tasks in the backlog, so on, which is, and then these guys from two, they should uh, call three. And in this way, we are introducing dependencies between our teams and we want to work as much autonomous as possible. That's why we choose Kafka. And in this approach with Kafka, we are simply, some of the services are simply pushing some data into Kafka, some events. And events are more or less key value pairs. Our events, uh, the key is UUID and the value is a JSON, JSON payload. So some services push uh, events into Kafka and we just, uh, some others read them back. But in order for this to work more or less smoothly, we want to stick to some common principles in our architecture. I'll just enumerate some of them and then we will deep, uh, have a deeper dive into the details. So our events, which we pub publish in Kafka, should be self-contained. What do I mean by that? I mean that when I read one event, I won't need to, many, uh, to make any more asynchronous calls or synchronous calls to process this event. So j just uh, reading the event is quite is enough. I will show example later. We have one very strict rule that every, when we produce events about entity, only one service can produce uh, these events. So we, if we have product service, we cannot have two services which produ uh, produce events about products. This is very a strict requirement. Everyone interested in products, for example, consumes this topic and stores only the relevant part of uh, the information about the product. I'll show example again. Uh, this is something that we ca call partial uh, replication or smart replication. Of course, this brings a lot of redundancy. Uh, we have, for example, we are managing 800,000 products currently. And if most of the services which are interested in uh, products, they just copy the, their share of data and store it locally in their local database, which is lots of redundancy. But we uh, think that this is a common problem with microservice uh, architecture, so we decided to live with that. Uh, we publish same entities with the same key because we use log compaction. I'll talk about this later. And messages have uh, versions because we want to be able to, uh, to implement important consumers. Here is uh, one example. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So while we were doing the rest uh, comparison where you call one service to call another one and so on, here don't you have the same issue like if you put a message in the Kafka, then the other microservice pick it up, do some logic, put another message at another microservice. So, this this uh, this may happen, of course. This may happen to some extent, but I, I have to, uh, I have said that we try that our messages are self-contained. They contain lots of information inside them. And further on, if if a service fails down the chain, then uh, it because the communication is asynchronous, we don't have such big disruptions in our system. So we have a situation in which uh, we are, for example, working with uh, data from external system, service which is reading it, and delivering, uh, delivering it to our service. Uh, in one case, we were, the external service were, was down for three days, and our service was still able to work. Of course, there might be situations in which we can't simply work. For example, we can't process orders and so on. But uh, with Kafka, I think we are much more resilient against this problem. 
Of course, if the, the health of the system is down, we won't be able to work. Yeah, I mean, the system will be up all the time, but you will have some like data corruption because half of the system, half of the microservices have finished their work correctly, and the last part didn't finish correctly in the event. Did you try the events? What do you mean? Uh, we, uh, I have a slide, especially I will tell you what we are doing in case uh, we are having errors. I have a separate slide for this. Yeah, this uh. Just one more thing in this context. So actually you don't, because you men mentioned performance, actually you don't gain performance, more resilience, I think. More resilience, but also performance because this course, uh, this yeah. synchronous course may consume quite a lot of time. You yeah, bring up system resources. Yeah, shoot and forget. The processing time of each microservice remains the same. So the total of doing a request from start to, to the end is again, the total is the same. You just change the communication channel. No, the total is not the same because you fire the event and then you forget about it and the service which yeah, is consuming. Until you receive the end result because when you fire an event, you're also maybe interested in the end result because with rest, you can also fire a REST response without receiving REST yeah. request but without receiving the response. But in this case here with uh, this synchronous call, we don't do it anymore because, for example, imagine that this uh, service worked uh, during the night and it published everything in Kafka. So we read all the, all the data which this service can produce, can ever produce, and we store this data locally. And we don't have these calls, we have only local calls. So it's, this is the way, we, we, we trade uh, redundancy for performance. But we have a lot of redundancy. We have all this data that this service uh, stores, we have, we have it here also. So we trade performance for redundancy, which is, well, um, well the bill for the hosting at the end is much bigger. <laughs> but I think we can, uh, we can handle that. Okay, here is, the, uh, here is uh, one, uh, one uh, example with the single producer, which I was talking about. We have only one product service, which is uh, publishing all data about the product. This is ID, GTIN. GTIN is the barcode which you, uh, which you can scan, name, description, packaging, if it's loose or if it's in a box and so on and so on and so on. This, these events are quite big. On the, on the other end, we have, uh, for example, the BBD service, uh, which uh, my team implemented recently. BBD stands for best before date, and this is one service which is used uh, by the guys in the warehouse. They check the expiration date of the products and they throw away, for example, if the milk is uh, expired, they throw it away. Uh, but in order for our service to operate correctly, we, for example, we don't care about the unit the unit uh, of, of the product. It may be kilos, grams, liters, we don't care uh, because it's irrelevant to our service. We just uh, copy this uh, GTIN because the guy should scan something and we copy the name so, so he can see what he has scanned and the category ID because we are in, uh, interested in some rules. <coughs> and once we, uh, once we start this service, we read all the data from, for all the products and we st store just this share of data and we start listening for updates eventually if somebody, uh, for, if somebody changed the name, let's say. But we don't, uh, <clears throat> we don't uh, need any more product data. So when the guy scans something, we don't need to make a call to the product service. We just, uh, we just make this uh, call locally. And we call this principle, having data is better than needing data because we always have the data locally and we can always query this data. Of course, when this product service is down for some reason, we can still continue working without any big disruptions in the warehouse because the guys actually have, we have all this data. It may not be very fresh, but we have it all here. For, and the warehouse can continue working even without product service for several days even. Of course, we have some issues which uh, wouldn't occur if we used REST. Let's say we have a, <coughs> our product owner comes one day and says, guys, I want a new, uh, a new feature in our BBD app. Okay, for this new feature, we are needing a new property from the product service. But we are running a situation in which we do not have this property because 
we are running in a situation where we need data, but we don't have data. So what we do in this case is uh, we are starting the development of the new feature. We're developing these uh, columns in the database and so on. And when we uh, deploy our service in the cloud, we are resetting our offsets of the consumer group. And by resetting the offsets, we start to read the Kafka topics once again from the very beginning. And when we read them, we are starting to populate, populate this property until, this, uh, <clears throat> until we read the complete topic. This problem may happen on the producer side also. And what the guys are doing and what we are doing if uh, we are running into such a situation is that we republish all the data into Kafka once again. Once we have the, the new data, we republish everything once again. So all the consumers which are attached to this topic are free to read it again and fill in their property. Please note that these things with the new property are, is compatible change. Sometimes we may have incompatible change. I will uh, reach this point and explain uh, what, uh, what we do in this case. Uh, one question from the previous side. So if the, is the, the case is the second one, when you want to uh, redeploy the product service, mm -hmm. then because it's uh, only the PPT service is interested in this packaging, but still all the other yep. services will need to process the yes. product information. Yes, they will. If we have 100 services which are listening for the products, then 100 services we will read again. Although they are not interested in this. Although they are absolutely not interested in this, uh, in, in this, in this event. You said that you had 800,000? 800,000 products, yes. Yeah, that's nothing. And all these, all services which are listening for the products, we will read all the data once again. Yeah, when you redo something. Yeah, when we redo something. But hopefully this doesn't happen very often. And we also have this requirement for our services that each service should be able to republish all this data on demand whenever it's necessary. So this is absolute requirement. Our services should be able to, uh, to trigger a republishment of this data. I mentioned something about self-contained uh, self events. What does it mean? It means that when I read some data, I don't need to make any further calls, either synchronous or asynchronous. So we try our events are, that our events are self-contained. Here on this side, you can see one event which is not self-contained. Why? Because there is this property which says, okay, the remaining details of the events are here. Please make a request and retrieve some data. This is not a self-contained event. On the other hand, we have some self-contained event which contains all the information about the given entity. So when I read it, I don't need to make any more requests. Did you keep issues with the maximum size of the messages? Uh, no, I think it's uh, by default it's one megabyte or something like that, but we never hit, uh, we never hit such issue. issue. We are storing JSON and I can imagine entity with JSON one megabyte or two megabytes, hopefully. I hope I won't see this soon. Okay, how we use log compaction? <clears throat> Let's say we have a scenario in which uh, we have published this uh, product in our system. We uh, publish it with this key, one, two, three, four, and it found its way to partition zero on with offset uh, two. Then our marketing department, of course, decided that this name is not uh, appealing enough for the end customer. We should do something. They opened uh, their UI and they changed the name of the product. In this case, we published another, another record, another record for this product with the same key, but with bigger version. And because the same keys, the same keys go to the same partition, this is the partitioning scheme, uh, it uh, found its way in the same partition as the previous product. And in this way, we can rely on log compaction. We keep data forever. We never delete data. We don't have log retention based on time or on size. We keep data forever. And in this situation, when the log compaction kicks in, simply this uh, first record may, may, may get deleted. Um, th there is something uh, important here. Uh, this is the, one of the reasons for which we never publish deltas 
as event. So if, if the name is changed, we will publish again the whole event, but not a delta, because we want to be able to rely on work compaction. And there is another gotcha here that we should never ever, or at least we should attempt to never ever change the number of partitions <coughs> per topic in production. Because if we change the number of partitions, then this, uh, this article, the second article, may find its way into another partition. And then we won't uh, be able to guarantee that uh, the log compaction will work. We won't be able to guarantee that we will read the events in sequence and so on. So we stick with the constant number of partitions. By default, the number of partitions our architects decide, decided, based on some maybe research, that uh, it should be 60 partitions per, uh, per topic. 60? 60. 60. Uh, this is transactional completeness. This is one very interesting property. <clears throat> and to explain it, I have prepared one example. Transactional completeness means that publishing a, an event into our system should leave the system in a consistent state. Uh, what can go wrong? In Germany, when you make online online request, you have to enter your zip code. And there is a shop which is responsible to handle orders for this zip code. But there are some shops which serve more than one zip code. For example, in this case, this store, this store, store one, serves zip 111 and 2222. So the store, if the store is the master entity, it's say that, that way, we can publish one event in Kafka, which says key store, store ID, payload, these are the zip codes which are served by this, uh, <coughs> by this store. What happens now if uh, another store opens up and we move this uh, zip code to be served by store, store number two? If we structure our event uh, in this way, <coughs> What we will do is we will fire two events. The first event will say that store one is currently engaged with zip one 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 one, and store two is engaged in with zip two 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 two. Of course, because these are different IDs, they may go into different partitions of our topic of our store topic, and some of our consumers may read this this event first. <coughs> When they read this event first, our system becomes uh, in a state in which, in which these two codes are assigned to store one and this, uh, this code is assigned to, to store two. This means that uh, zip code uh, 2222 is, uh, is served currently with two stores. How can we store, uh, how can we uh, resolve this? We can resolve this, for example, by reversing the relation. In this case, the master entity will be the zip code and the child will be the store. Here is how it, uh, how it looks like. So we have a zip code with, all the, with a store, another zip code with the, with the same store. What happens if we move, if we open another store, store two, and uh, we decide that uh, zip code 222 will be stored by it? We, we will fire event with the key of the zip code and we'll show which store, which store serves uh, <coughs> this zip code. In this way, we have achieved transactional completeness because these events do not leave our system in a state which is not consistent. Error handling, this interesting question. Error handling is a little bit tricky. Uh, let's imagine that we are, our consumer is reading some data and we have a book into our consumer. When we have a book into our consumer, we are throwing exception. For example, no pointer exception. Somebody screwed something very badly. Uh, in this case, we are experimenting currently with two strategies. One, uh, two strategies. One, of the, uh, one of them are uh, in final tries. We are starting to retry reading the message. We are using Kafka listener annotation and so on. So we are infinitely retrying uh, <coughs> this operation. This is backed up with uh, quite um, good, in my opinion, monitoring system, which is based on Prometheus, Grafana and Alert Manager. So our developers can get notification about this problem several seconds later or after it occurred. 
In this case, uh, we have to fix our consumer and redeploy it as soon as possible so that the consumption continues. Another, another thing which we are trying to experiment with is to move, to move the faulty messages within an error queue. When we do that, we can continue consuming, uh, consuming the, the queue, the, the topic. But at a later stage, we can go back, fix some error, go back and consume from the error queue all the messages that we have skipped. This is a little bit more difficult, but it doesn't block our consumers. Similar situation may occur in the producer side. Let's say the producers produce some faulty data. In this case, the consumers will start throwing exceptions or misbehaving and so on. In this case, the producer should fix the bug immediately and republish all the data once again into the Kafka topic so that the consumers can reconsume this. And the faulty messages later hopefully will be destroyed by the log consumption. Delivery semantics, we are currently using uh, only plain Kafka. I just want to say on the deadline strategy that they will have to deal with the synchronization of messages. Which will be a yes, we have to do this, which is, uh, which is complicated. Yeah. Because Kafka guarantees the order, but when you move to another queue... Yeah, the order is, uh, the messages start to get out of order. We have, by the way, versioning information in the message, one of these reasons. So we are always storing the version of uh, which is of the entity which we processed so this is this is uh, this is very tricky and yeah the other one is much easier and and i forgot to say that um, when we are using clock compaction we sometimes if we want to delete something forever we are uh, sending the so called tombstone messages which are messages with keys but without a body so they are getting destroyed by the log consumption Okay, delivery semantics, uh, as I have said, we are still not using Kafka streams, so we can choose between two delivery semantics, semantic models, at most once and at least once. Uh, this is something that, the first one, at most once, this is something that we avoid, we don't want to do that. How it works, first we read message, the message, then we acknowledge that we have read it, and then we process it. But unfortunately, the processing may, uh, may fail. In this case, we have acknowledged already the message. So we are sure that we will never read this message again. That's why the semantics is called at most once. We don't use at most once semantics. We use at least one semantics. In the at least one semantics, what we do is we read the message once, then we process it. And finally, when we are sure that uh, we have processed everything uh, correctly, we acknowledge the message. In order for this, this, this is uh, quite... Uh, <clears throat> um, we cannot miss messages in this, uh, in this way, but in order for this to, to work properly, we make sure that our consumers are it important. This means that we, can, uh, we are required to be able to consume several times the same message over and over again without any side effects. So we, our consumers, there is a requirement that they are important and we use at least once uh, delivery semantics. You stuck if you are consuming the same message? Yeah, uh, yeah, we can be stuck and uh, I, have, I have talked about that. Yeah, we can, we can be stuck. If we have book, for example, we can be stuck. And we have to fix it so that we can keep on consuming. So events, events in our system are API. I talked about a new property, but um, these properties were actually compatible change. Sometimes we have changes which are not compatible. We may delete one property or we may change the structure of the JSON format and so on. That's why all of our topics uh, have a suffix which is a given given version, for example, product v1. So our consumers, they belong, they, we have different consumers and they consume product v1. The guys from the product service decide that they should make a breaking change in the format of the JSON. And in this case, they are, should, what they should, what they must do is that they should uh, open another topic with increased version v2 
And yeah, they should start maintaining both queues. So if there is an update event, they should publish it here and they should publish it also here. So, so the consumers are not broken. Then uh, we are spreading the news that we have a new topic and we are urging our colleagues to start consuming product V2 instead of product V1. Time passes and in one beautiful day, all the consumers will switch to product V2 and then this, uh, this um, topic will be no longer needed. At this moment of time, the guys from the product service should do a cleanup of their code and they should stop maintaining the product V1, uh, the product V1 topic and they should delete it at some moment of time because all our consumers are now stick to another topic. Now, something about scalability. <clears throat> We deploy, we deploy our services in the cloud and uh, we choose how many instances they are running. They are basically stateless, they may run in many instances or in few instances. And something that we do not want, do not want, is that the same two instances of one service consume the same, the same message. This would be something unpleasant because we have to make some synchronization, some complicated stuff. Instead, uh, consumer group, groups come into, into the game. All our consumers, for example, all the instances of our BBD service, belong to the same consumer group. If they belong to the same consumer group, we ensure in this way that uh, each partition of our topic is assigned to exactly, uh, to exactly one consumer. So, in this example, we have, in this simple example, we have two consumers here and let's say three partitions because they belong to the same consumer group. Uh, the first partition is assigned to here and the other two partitions are assigned here. So uh, basically, if we change the consumer group, of course, all the offsets are reset and the topics are reset from the beginning. But again, we won't have this problem. By the way, this is one of the approaches some colleagues are using to reconsume the topic. They just change the consumer group <coughs> to which their consumers belong and they are, uh, they are starting consuming from, from the beginning. We are using in Spring Consumer Seek Aware interface in which helps us to reset our offsets. At the end, I want to uh, tell you some facts about our current installation. We, have, uh, we are running uh, installation of Kafka in Google Cloud. We have installed six brokers. They're backed up by five Zookeeper instances. Currently, all the brokers are migrated to Kafka 2.0. Uh, we have more than uh, 160 consumers of different topics. And we have more than 130 topics, but some of them are topics with uh, the same topic with different versioning. Our largest, uh, our largest topic is the product topic, which contains about uh, 800,000, between 800,000 and 1 million uh, records. We are using a default replication factor of three for our topics, and we are required to uh, set acknowledgements to all. And the default partition number for per topic is 60 when we create this topic and we never ever want to change to change that and basically for two years we are more or less happy with our installation sometimes we need uh, sometimes we need uh, synchronous operations which can be achieved with Kafka for example when the customer orders something we need to um, to deliver to query for data in this case we still fall back to rest but this is a very rare case. Actually, we are maintaining maybe how much, 10 or 11 services, and only one is using REST currently. The other ones are stuck with Kafka. And yeah, that's, that's it. That's, uh, that were the details for our system. Yeah. I hope that it was interesting. <laughs>